I was sitting on the hood of the car, facing the house with the number 128, when the door suddenly opened and they came out. Her face turned pale at the sight of me. She couldn't look me in the eye, looking away. When I stood up, he instinctively raised his arms defensively. Don't worry, I reassured them. You're both not worth my time. With that, I got back in the car and drove away, thinking about the long chain of events that led to this tense meeting. I first met Jim when his family became our new neighbors. At the age of eight, he was my age and the only boy in our neighborhood. Although there were several girls our age among them, Jim and I quickly became close friends. By the end of the fourth grade, we were as close as twin brothers. We played sports together, played baseball league and soccer on the Pop Warner team. I always had his back, and he always had mine. If someone was teasing Jim, he was teasing me, and vice versa. From that moment on, we were inseparable until high school. I first met Laura in 10th grade, and we started dating. By senior year, we were still dating. Our friends Jim and Annabelle Spears also became a couple, and we often went on double dates together. At the prom, Laura and I spent a special moment in one room, and Jim and Annabelle in another. After graduation, our paths parted. Jim decided to enroll in the Navy, not college. Annabelle was upset by his departure and resentful of him, but promised to wait until he found a permanent job before joining him. Laura and I both went to college. I went to Eastern Michigan University to study civil engineering, and Laura went to the University of Michigan to study information technology. The two universities were only half an hour away from each other in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, which allowed us to maintain a relationship. But several times Laura canceled our plans to go on a date with someone she met at the University of Michigan, keeping it a secret from me. I got this information from friends who also studied at Michigan. They informed me that on those evenings when I couldn't come, she was seeing someone. One evening I arrived just in time to see her get into a car with some guy and drive away. I followed them to a restaurant on Ann Arbor Road, waited ten minutes for them to sit down, and then went inside. To my horror, I found that they were sitting in a booth in the back, not opposite, but close to each other. He hugged her, and she seemed pleased, showing no signs of discomfort or attempts to create distance between them. Fortunately, there was an empty booth at the opposite end of the hall, where I was able to sit down without attracting Laura's attention. It was only when the waitress asked about my drink order and Laura heard my voice that she turned to face me. I pretended to be interested in the menu, avoiding direct eye contact with her, and yet I saw surprise in her eyes when she abruptly pulled her hand away from the guy she was next to and distanced herself from him. The expression on his face at that moment clearly indicated his confusion, his silent doubt of her actions. From this look, it was clear that their meeting was not a one time, not the second, and not the third. They had been in a relationship for some time, long enough for him to embrace her calmly and without hesitation. Despite the fact that I was not privy to their conversation, Laura's anxious glances in my direction did not go unnoticed. I casually leaned back in my chair and pretended not to notice her concern. After finishing my meal, I left, without giving any sign that I was watching Laura, and drove home. The next day, which fell on Friday, Laura and I planned a date night consisting of dinner and going to the cinema. But when the time came, I didn't go anywhere without any explanations and excuses. I turned off my phone and got comfortable with a fascinating book. I attended a party at the Delta Phi house on Saturday night and had a great time. I met a stunning brunette named Robin, and we shared a few dances. She even gave me her phone number and asked me to call her. The next day, I was engrossed in preparing for Monday's classes when I was interrupted by the doorbell. I looked through the peephole and saw that it was Laura. I opened the door, and she walked past me into the room. She turned to me and demanded, where were you on Friday night and why didn't you answer the phone? After closing the door, I turned to her and asked, Which question do you want me to answer first? Don't delay, Rob. What's the matter? I replied, Okay, I'll answer them in the order I like best. 
First, let me explain where I've been, mostly at home, but I went to a frat party on Saturday night. Why didn't you answer the phone? It's simple. I didn't pick up the phone because he didn't call, but it was my fault because I turned it off. By the way, where were you on Friday night? I was at home, ordered pizza, and read a great book. Why didn't you call and say you couldn't come? I thought you had plans with your boyfriend. Wait, which guy? You're my boyfriend, Rob. Who was that man you were with at the restaurant on Thursday night? He's just an acquaintance of mine. We're not in love with each other. Sitting so close, leaning against him when he hugs you, isn't it romantic? What would you call it then? It's not like that. We're just friends. If you don't see anything wrong, why didn't you come over and say hello? Why didn't you invite me to join you and introduce me to your friend? Could you sit down and have a little chat with me? Maybe you didn't do it because you didn't want him to know who I was. Why didn't you come up and talk to me yourself if that bothers you? I wanted to see how you would react. Why did you want to see my reaction? Because I've heard too much about how often you date other guys when I'm not around. I heard that you dated other guys on the nights when you were supposed to go on dates with me, but cancelled them at the last moment. I wanted to see how you would behave with another guy. I'm not your property, Rob. We never agreed to be just the two of us. That's what I thought, Laura. I gave you a ring and a sweater with a letter as a sign that we are together. A sweater with a letter and a ring? Is that supposed to mean something? It's so immature, Rob. Maybe it was during my school years, but I don't remember you returning these things to me when we graduated from high school. You didn't mention that our relationship ended as soon as we left school. I don't mind. If you don't feel obligated, then neither will I. At a recent party, I met a nice girl who gave me her phone number. Laura's expression turned sour and she growled, Great, come on, I don't care, and quickly left. When she left, I thought that she wasn't making excuses, didn't promise not to repeat her actions anymore, and didn't try to convince me that I was the only one for her. She had gone beyond the thinking of a schoolgirl. Now she saw herself as a mature woman, and something needed to change. It wasn't an easy decision after being together for so long, but it's better to sort out your thoughts now than later. The days passed with homework until on Thursday I finally got in touch with Robin. After a short conversation, we set up a date for Friday evening. I picked her up, we had dinner, and then, instead of going to the movies as planned, she offered to attend a party she'd heard about. The party was held in an apartment in Belleville, and we arrived at about 8 o'clock. To my surprise, as soon as we entered, we immediately found ourselves face to face with Laura and the man she had met the night before. Oh no! I squealed. What happened? Robin asked. They are, I replied, gesturing at Laura and the man. Do you know them? I know her. Do you know Miss Piggy? Miss Piggy. That's her nickname. Why is she called that? She's slutty. She acts like a real pig. That's why people call her Miss Piggy. Are you sure she's promiscuous? What else can you call a woman who is in a serious relationship? but still seeks the attention of other men when her partner is not around. Are you absolutely sure about this information? More precisely as far as her reputation is concerned? I can't say for sure myself, but I have heard about it from several people who claim to have communicated with her. How do you know her? I was actually the person she was planning to marry until last Thursday, when I caught her with the one she's with now. Oh my god, will there be fireworks today? Unfortunately, no. We broke up on Sunday. Now it's official. I'm free. What is the probability that I would have heard from you if Thursday had not happened? It is negligible. But Thursday happened anyway, and here we are, ready to enjoy life. So, let's take advantage of it. She took my hand and led me across the room to introduce me to the owner. Laura, who had been frozen in the corner when we appeared, noticed me and looked surprised. Is it because she didn't expect to see me at such a party? Or because she was caught with a new guy again? Robin led me to a tall man and a blonde woman. They introduced themselves as Gary and Artis, and we had small talk for a while. After that, Robin dragged me out for a drink. 
The basement has been turned into a recreation room and a dance floor. Robin and I spent the night dancing and drinking, meeting new people along the way. But every time I caught Laura's eye, her expression remained unreadable to me. At about 11, Robin announced that it was time for her to leave, as she had important plans for Saturday. On the way back, Robin noticed, your ex often looked in your direction during the evening. She was shocked to see me there. I don't think so. She probably didn't like seeing you with someone else. That's how she ended our relationship. Maybe, but she's not as happy about the breakup as you're suggesting. She may have to get used to the situation. Does this mean that I can expect to see you more often? Or are you planning to date other girls as well? Personally, I prefer to focus on one girl. I really enjoyed your company tonight, and I would like to ask you out again. If you agree, you'll be the only girl I'm dating. And if I'm not ready to devote myself to one person? Just let me know and I'll find someone else to date. If she refuses, I'll contact you again to see how things are going. If you continue to refuse, I will continue to look for another girl who will be more open to this idea. I appreciate your desire to try. How about tomorrow night? That sounds great. After walking her to the door and saying goodnight to her, when I turned to leave she asked me to stop. When I turned back to her, she admitted that she doesn't usually kiss on a first date, but this time she decided to make an exception. And with that, she kissed me. See you tomorrow, she said, and went home. When I got home, it turned out that Dad was still awake, and he told me. Laura called. She's very upset. It's too late to call back. I'll do it in the morning. The next day I overslept, as usual on Saturday morning. When I finally woke up and went to the kitchen for coffee, Mom said, Laura has already called twice this morning. I'll call her back after the first cup of coffee. Are you okay? Mom asked. We're not together anymore. Does she know about this? She has to because she has made a decision. At that moment, the phone rang. Mom picked up the phone and said, It's for you. This is Laura. I picked up the phone and she asked, Why didn't you call? I explained, It was too late to call when I got home last night and today I just got out of bed. She replied, That's not what I meant. Why didn't you call me last night and ask me out on our usual Friday date? We discussed this last Sunday, Laura. You said that we don't have an exclusive relationship, and you decided to date other guys. I told you that if you were dating others, then I would do the same, and you stormed out of the house. This is not what I wanted, Rob. You should have understood that. Don't make excuses, Laura. You've already been on a date with that guy I saw you with last Thursday. I wasn't with him, Rob. I came to the party alone, and coincidentally he was there too. Okay, Laura, if you want to believe that, it doesn't change anything for me. I'm starting to hear rumors about you and your actions. For example, about how you got the nickname Miss Piggy. I don't know where you're getting your information from, Rob, but it's not true. Why should I believe that it's not true if I saw you with someone else in a restaurant? And I find it hard to believe that you accidentally bumped into him at a party. He was too close to you and hugged you when I came up. You're not interested in an exclusive relationship with me, and I'm not interested in being one of your many options. Could you return the ring and sweater along with the letter? I understand that for a mature person like you, these gestures may seem insignificant, but for me they are of great importance. See you later. Goodbye. Mom noticed. Your statement sounded convincing. She came to the conclusion that my attention was not enough for her, and as I said before, I have no desire to be just another face in the crowd. I started spending a lot of time with Robin. Meanwhile, Jim wrote to me about his life every two weeks. He graduated from the camp and was now undergoing special training. He joined the Navy Construction Battalion, also known as the Navy SEALs, where he mastered the skills of construction and destruction. Although he didn't ask about Annabelle, I also tried not to mention her in my answers. I knew he wouldn't want to hear about her life. Less than a week after he left, Annabelle started dating a guy she met at a party. Just a month later he left, and she moved in with a man from her job. 
Three months later, the relationship ended, and she began living with a man she met when he towed her car to the store. There were rumors that he forced her to participate in questionable activities with his friends. Suddenly, Annabelle disappeared without a trace. We only found out about her whereabouts after I received a letter from Jim, who was trained and served in Norfolk. Upon arrival, he sent to find Annabelle, and she came to him. He expressed a desire for me to become his best man, but admitted that he did not have time to prepare. Completing this task as soon as possible would allow them to get housing at the base faster. My heart sank at the thought of the possible betrayal he might face, knowing that perhaps another man was already waiting for her as soon as he left. When I was born, my grandparents set up a college tuition fund for me, so I never had to worry about money. I had enough money to pay for my tuition and rent an apartment off campus, and I could live comfortably. In junior years, Robin and I decided to live together, which gave me an idea of what family life could be like. I treasured every moment. Over time, I began to think about making our stay permanent. Despite my doubts, Robin showed no signs of wanting to end our relationship. She didn't show any signs of concern until I suggested she start looking for an engagement ring. It was then that she revealed her plan to return to California after graduating from university and marry her childhood sweetheart, who was currently in England on a Rod scholarship. We both knew about each other's romantic relationship. He knew about you, and I knew about the Englishwoman he was staying with. Realizing that it is impossible for two young, healthy people to refrain from intimacy for a long time, we decided to build an open relationship. It shouldn't affect us in any way, Rob. I didn't immediately feel the effects, but they definitely affected me. It all came down to the fact that I abruptly moved from a romantic relationship to a platonic friendship. The problem was that I didn't find pleasure in just hanging out with friends. I craved something deeper than just physical intimacy. As a result, Robin and I gradually drifted apart. Almost four months after Robin ended our romantic relationship, she asked me about my discomfort, and I spoke frankly about my feelings. Forgive me, my love. Sometimes I wish Alex wasn't so dear to me, so I could be the one you want. If it wasn't for Alex, you'd be the one I need. Thank you. So what should we do now? Shall we flip a coin to decide who stays and who leaves? There's no need for that. I always knew this moment would come, and my mom still hasn't found someone to rent my room to. She decided it was better to leave it to me. I will stay until I turn 40 or until she has grandchildren. So you stay, and I'm leaving. Are we still going to be friends? Always. She hugged me. I returned home for a week. And on Friday evening, as I was sitting in my room writing an article that was supposed to be submitted next week, my mother called out to me from downstairs. Rob, someone has come to see you. I went downstairs and saw Mom chatting with Laura. Mom looked at me and went into the kitchen, leaving Laura and me alone. Hi, Rob, she greeted me. Hi, Laura, I replied. How are you? she asked. So-so, but I hope that everything will get better. I replied. Robin called me and told me you were free again. She said if I hurry up, I can be first in line, Laura explained. Why do you want to be first in line? I asked. Why do you even have to be first in line? If I hadn't made a stupid mistake, none of this would have happened. Robin would never have appeared in your life. I don't want to stand in line, Rob. I just want to get back to where my real place is, to where we belong. Raising her left hand, she confessed, I never gave you the ring back. My cool ring adorned her left ring finger. Alice Johnson is having a party tonight. Will you take me with you? She showed me the ring at the party, and when I asked her about it, she said, Just so everyone knows that I have a right to you, baby. I brought you back and I want everyone to know about it, she said. The unexpected moment came after the party. During the car ride home, she was silent, looking out the passenger side window. When we arrived at her house, I suggested that we go in search of an apartment together on Saturday. I noted that renting an apartment would be more profitable than living in motels for a long time. 
Are you suggesting that I move in with you? What is it? She asked. That thought definitely crossed my mind. What time is it? About nine o'clock. Great. Laura and I moved into a two-bedroom apartment halfway between Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, turning the second bedroom into an office with Laura's computer desk and mine. About a month after moving in, Jim returned home for a 30-day vacation, and he and Annabelle spent a lot of time with us. Jim and Annabelle seemed to get along great, so maybe my initial doubts about her turned out to be unfounded when she left. Three weeks after Jim returned to his duties, Annabelle unexpectedly arrived. Jim was seconded to Iraq, and Annabelle, who was looking forward to his return to base, did not wait for him. Instead, she stayed with the guy she lived with when she visited Jim in Norfolk for two weeks. Three weeks later, she was spotted with her ex-boyfriend, which again sparked rumors about wild parties she allegedly threw at his apartment. I considered approaching her, but Laura convinced me not to. She said it was none of our business, and as far as we understood, Jim and Annabelle have an open relationship. I have heard that in the army it is customary for both spouses to agree to another relationship during a long separation, she explained. But it doesn't look like Jim will agree to that. So what are you planning to do? Should I tell him? He adores her and will not be happy if he is told that she is unfaithful. He may even accuse you of ruining his life. It's better to let Jim handle this himself. Jim returned from Afghanistan just in time to be by my side as best man at my wedding to Leroy. After that, he and Annabelle went to Norfolk for the rest of the service. As soon as he was demobilized, they returned home, and Jim found a job at a construction company, driving heavy machinery. Time passed quickly, and Jim and Annabelle became regular guests at our house, visiting us at least once every two weeks. Their relationship seemed strong, and there were no signs that there were any problems between them. Laura's theory turned out to be correct when Jim's company won a contract to lay a pipeline in Alaska. Harsh conditions at the construction site forced Jim to leave his wife Annabelle at home for the duration of the four-month project. Suspicions arose when, a week later, Annabelle was spotted in a motel room with Gary Mellows, the owner of the company. To make matters worse, Gary's car was often seen parked in Jim's driveway in the evenings. When the Alaska project ran into complications and was extended for another two months, the situation only got more complicated. Laura and Annabelle had an appointment with the same doctor. On the day Annabelle received the upsetting news that she was seven weeks pregnant and her husband Jim had been missing for more than three months, Laura found herself in the doctor's office. Laura learned about this news from two nurses who worked at the clinic and had previously studied with them. Knowing that Laura was close to Annabelle, the nurses asked her how she thought Jim would react to the news. Patient confidentiality takes a back seat when it comes to spreading gossip among friends. After thinking about it, she confidently stated, Jim will never know. If my assumptions are correct, Annabelle will have an abortion and Jim won't even be home when it happens. But things didn't go as planned. Someone, whom Laura did not dissuade, informed Jim about the situation. Jim hurried home, rented a car and parked unnoticed on the next street. He waited patiently for Gary's car to pull up to the entrance and watched them enter the house. After waiting 15 minutes for Gary and Annabelle to get down to business, he entered the house with a digital camera in his hands, ready to capture the lovers during the act. Fifteen minutes after he started filming, an ambulance arrived and took Gary to the hospital. The police were ready to arrest Jim until he showed them the photos he had taken. In a series of images taken with a Canon Rebel camera in continuous shooting mode, Mellows could be seen pouncing on Jim. It seemed like he was just trying to take Jim's camera away, but the sequence of events made it clear to Jim that he was being attacked and was acting in self-defense. The police believed Jim's words and left. Twenty minutes after they left, Annabelle came out onto the porch with her suitcase and closed the door behind her. The divorce went smoothly, as did the lawsuit against Mellows for alienation of affection. He filed a lawsuit against Mellows for harassment, claiming that Mellows hired him with the intention of kicking him out of town so he could move in with his wife. 
Instead of entering into an out-of-court settlement and avoiding public attention, Melrose decided to fight the case. This decision was not justified, as it turned out in court that he really maintained a relationship with the employee's wife while he was away. The jury sided with Jim's employee and awarded him one and a half million dollars. After deducting legal fees and taxes, Jim had just over $750,000 left. After he paid off the house, he installed an above-ground swimming pool and bought a new Ford. As soon as the divorce was finalized, Annabelle disappeared and, according to rumors, left town. To settle the lawsuit, Mellows had to sell off equipment and property, which led to the loss of business, as customers and potential buyers questioned his reliability. Jim had some money left, and he approached me with the idea of starting his own company and taking over the business that Mellows had lost. I took up design, and Jim took up construction work. Laura and I thought carefully about our finances, had discussions, and eventually decided to move on. This led to the creation of the R&J Constructors Partnership. We have successfully completed this task, gaining many clients who previously worked with Mellows, and even surpassing him in many projects. Jim was proud of our success, and made sure everyone knew when we would surpass Mellows. Time passed, and the next five years passed quickly. Jim went on dates, but he never found someone he wanted to settle down with forever. He spent a lot of time with Laura and me, and once a week we usually met with Jim and his girlfriend. Everything was going smoothly. Laura moved up the career ladder, getting the position of regional manager and being considered a strong candidate for the role of vice president. It seemed to me that the situation could not change for the better, and unfortunately, I was right. On Tuesday afternoon, after finishing a meeting with a potential client, Gary Melrose came up to me and offered to buy me a drink. I didn't have any personal complaints about Gary. I think if a slutty girl like Annabelle offered it to a lonely guy like Gary, then he can't be blamed for accepting the gift. I never believed the story that Gary sent Jim out of town for Annabelle. I always knew that Annabelle was promiscuous, so I assumed that she probably came to Gary's office to collect Jim's salary and let Gary know that she was lonely because of Jim's absence. Anyway, his problems were with Jim, not me, so I accepted his offer to buy me a drink. As soon as he sat down, he asked, Maybe you should think about selling. Sell it? Why would I even think about it? Let Jim be my partner. Are you kidding? Not really. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but just take a look at this. He opened his briefcase, took out a folder, and handed it to me. I took it, opened it, and was shocked. When I opened the folder, the first thing I found was a photo of Laura and Jim walking hand in hand to a motel room. Scrolling through the rest of the photos, I saw a lot of shots of the couple entering and leaving the room, as well as numerous intimate moments that they shared with each other. Glancing at Gary, he confided sheepishly, I'm really sorry. I was following him to gather information and get revenge. When the private investigator handed me these photos, I had no idea that it was your wife. I realized that she belongs to someone else, only by the ring on her finger. I hired a private investigator to uncover her identity and gather information for my revenge. Why? You were the one who was guilty. You sent him on a business trip on purpose. No, not on purpose. Yes, I had an affair with his wife, but I never ordered him to leave town to be with her. She came into my office, closed the door, and began to undress. She looked at me for a long time and said, You sent Jim away, so now you have to take care of me until he gets back. Since I'm not in a relationship, should I have turned down Annabelle's offers? In my opinion, the whole situation can be traced back to Jim's actions. It is well known that Annabelle had a depraved reputation since her school days. Jim should have known about this, but did nothing to solve the problem. Now I have to deal with the consequences of his negligence, especially in connection with the trial. I am determined to get justice and fix everything. I'm sorry you're in the middle of all this, Rob. Do you know how long this has been happening to them? According to the findings of a private investigator, at least a year, maybe more. 
I can't believe it's been going on for so long and I didn't know about it. If she never gave any reason for suspicion, how could you find out about it? So what's the reason for wanting to buy out my share? What do you hope to gain by becoming Jim's partner? Think about this. As an equal partner, my opinion has no less weight. If he suggests doing A, I can speak for B. My point of view will always be the opposite of his. In addition, I will understand our pricing strategies and make sure that our prices are higher than those of competitors. I will financially ruin the company, as a result of which Jim will suffer losses. I have carefully assessed the situation, and if the business collapses, we will be able to sell the assets, and I will return most of my investments. I won't make a profit, except for the money I earn at another company by undercharging for the job Jim is fighting for. On the other hand, I won't incur significant losses either. What if Jim decides to make your life miserable until you give up and sell your share to him or someone else? The time he caught me with his wife, my first instinct was to grab the camera from him. He managed to take three good pictures before I realized that I had to focus on protecting myself, not the camera. If he tries to do it again, I won't let him get off that easy. I'm sure I can handle him if I have to. So, what are you going to do? Maybe, but I want to do my own investigation before moving on. After discussing a possible deal, I told him the specific amount that I had in mind. He said it was feasible and asked me to contact him if I decided to make a deal. When I left the meeting, I was overcome by calmness and confusion. How could Laura and Jim have carried out this plan for almost a year without my knowledge? There were no signs that Laura was unhappy with me, no diminution of affection, no signs that our relationship was less than ideal, at least from my point of view. I didn't know what went wrong. Detective Gary's report and photographs seemed legitimate, but I was plagued by doubts. The photos could have been faked, and Gary could have ulterior motives. To make sure of this, before taking any action, I decided to conduct further investigation. Back at the office, I contacted a friend who worked at an insurance agency and asked him to recommend reliable investigators in suspicious cases. After receiving this information, I called and made an appointment. Thirteen days later, after conducting a thorough investigation, I finally felt confident in the truth. It turned out that on Wednesdays, when Jim was supposed to be at the construction site, he met with Laura at the Comfort Inn on Melrose. I wondered how she managed to find time off from work for meetings. As for me, I just needed to decide on my next actions. I already had a clear idea of what I wanted, but I needed to develop a strategy for how to achieve it. After a two-hour consultation with a lawyer, I had a list of options and limitations, as well as a list of tasks that needed to be solved. Since our breakup was amicable, everything will be divided equally. But I was worried that she would receive a portion of the profits from the sale of my stake in the company. In the end, I reluctantly admitted that the only way out was to cheat. Despite this, she will still receive part of the funds. I made a deal with Mellows, agreeing to officially sell him my share in the company for a third of the true purchase price. This amount was transferred to a bank account opened only in my name. The remaining two-thirds were transferred to an offshore account I created. Our agreement stipulated that Mellows would not show up at the office and would not occupy my desk until the day I presented the necessary documents to Laura and Jim. Laura, about the divorce, citing adultery, and Jim, about the sale of a share. Despite the fact that I live in a state where there is no right of guilt, I had the opportunity to file a lawsuit for adultery. The outcome of the case would depend on the judge appointed to us and, perhaps, would lead to a more favorable division than the standard 50-50 division of property. But in order for the claim of adultery to stand up in court, I needed concrete evidence. After reviewing the reports of private detectives, it became clear to Gary that they constantly visited the same motel every Wednesday. To gather more evidence, my own detective rented a motel room and bribed the receptionist to put them in this particular room, where video surveillance was installed. On Wednesday morning I called Maria, our secretary, 
and asked her to tell Jim that I would be absent that morning due to a visit to the dentist. I also asked her to tell me that if I feel unwell after the tooth extraction, I may not be able to come in the afternoon. I understand, boss. I suggest you go home and rest, Maria advised. In my experience, tooth extraction is usually painful when the anesthesia wears off. After Laura left for work, I left the house for a while and returned to find a locksmith who replaced all the locks at 9 o'clock. As soon as he was done, I went to the bank and emptied both accounts and the safe. Although the lawyer advised me to take only half, my mood was devoid of any warmth. I was determined to make life difficult for Laura. Eventually she would get her share, but only after she started fighting. In addition, I took money out of the business which, in my opinion, rightfully belonged to me, and was ready to reimburse her if necessary. Jim had the opportunity to go to court to get the money back, but he didn't do it while I had it. My detective called me at 12.10 a.m. and informed me that the couple had arrived and were staying in room 128. I arrived at the scene, spoke briefly with the detective, and then sat on the hood of the car in front of the license plate and waited for the couple to get out. When they got out, there was a brief altercation, after which I drove off in my car. As I was driving away, a man got out of another car, approached the couple and handed them some documents. Laura was given a temporary restraining order, according to which she had to stay 500 feet away from me. To get this order I had to resort to deception tactics. I fabricated a story that a third party informed me that Jim and Laura had discussed my insurance and the cost of my business. A decision on whether to make the ban permanent has not yet been made, but it may take several weeks. It was another way to get Laura into trouble. The main thing was that she was not allowed to enter the house without the presence of a person appointed by the court, and I was not going to make it easier for her by providing new keys to the locks. A short note with a mockery was attached to Jim's documents on the seizure of property. You are familiar with how these lawsuits work, aren't you? After leaving the motel, I called Gary to make sure everything was ready for his first day at work. After parking my car in the long-term parking lot at the airport and hiding my mobile phone in the glove compartment, I boarded a flight to Cabo San Lucas. After a week of scuba diving and relaxing on the beach, I returned home and, checking my phone, found that several voice messages were waiting for me. Most of them were from Laura, and a few were from Jim. It was amazing to hear him, given our history. No matter what, I decided to leave them both behind and focus on moving forward. Although I was kind of interested in listening to their explanations, in the end I decided to leave the past in the past and move on. I didn't think about the reasons for their betrayal. Knowing that I would not be home for a week, I called my lawyer upon my return. He offered to contact Laura, who tried to contact me twice a day to gain access to the house and pick up my things. Just when I was about to ask him to sort out the situation, I came up with a mischievous idea, another way to make fun of her. I called her and asked about her needs. I want to pick up my clothes and personal belongings, but I can't get into the house with a court-appointed person because I don't have a key, and the court staff forbade me to break down the door. You have nothing to take because I donated all your stuff to Goodwill. I have no desire to keep reminders of you in the house. There's not a single thing of yours left in the house, not even a hair clip. Rob, you had no right to do that. I had every right to do what I did, just as you had the right to betray me. We really need to talk, Rob. It's not what you think. Let's be honest, Laura. I saw what was going on with Jim, and it wasn't just innocent fun. I know the truth. Goodbye, Laura, I said before hanging up. Even though all her things were still in the house, I decided to play with her a little. She'll come for her things eventually, but not any time soon. I've always had a good relationship with Maria, our secretary, accountant, chef, and bottle washer. So I called her to see how things were going. The situation is not ideal. It certainly does not affect me personally, but it definitely does not benefit the company. It seems that there are constant conflicts between Gary and Jim, and disagreements arise over trifles. Jim issues an order, and Gary refuses to follow it in response. In addition, 
Jim places an order, and Gary cancels it as soon as Jim is not in the office. These disagreements are preventing important work from being completed, as Jim and Gary are busy with their differences. I got tired of it to such an extent that last Friday I wrote a letter of resignation, but Gary offered to double my salary if I stayed, so in the end, I decided not to leave. On Thursday, there was a physical altercation between them, as a result of which Jim suffered a broken nose, but there was no clear winner. Why did you leave us and side with Gary? I told her the whole situation. She was silent for a moment and then declared, Now I have another incentive to stay. Which one is it? I asked. I can help Gary. I never liked Jim. He was constantly flirting with me even though he knew I was engaged. He even said once that he would fire me if I didn't go on a date with him, and we both knew what he meant. When I asked him what he thought you'd say if you fired me, he didn't say anything. You should have told me, I said. Why? She answered. It was a personal problem and I dealt with it. I'm sorry about what happened between you and Laura Robb. But there may be a positive aspect to this situation, at least for me. What do you mean? It means you're single again. How do you feel about being harassed? I thought you were engaged. That was until I discovered that this jerk cheated on me the same way he cheated on you, Laura. When did this happen? About three weeks ago. Well, darling, if you're interested, I'll give you preference when I start dating again. But it won't happen soon. I don't want to give Laura a reason to use me against herself. I'll be patient, but if you ever get lonely and want someone to join you for dinner, think of me. I appreciate it, thank you. My phone rang 16 times that day. 14 calls from Laura and 2 from Jim. I couldn't imagine what this jerk could say that I would like to hear. If he called to ask for something, it certainly wasn't about me. I ignored all the calls, returned home and cooked dinner for myself. I called Gary Mellows to see how his plan was going. Everything seems to be going well. I strategically positioned myself at your desk when he entered the office. When he saw me, he looked puzzled and demanded to know why I was in the office and occupying your desk. I grinned and informed him that I was his new partner. Shock showed on his face, as if steam was about to come out of his ears as he studied our agreement. This marked the beginning of our collaboration on a strong note. He requested a tanker truck for the Wilkins site because the front loader and other equipment ran out of diesel fuel. I quickly canceled the order after he left the office. When one of the loaders ran out of fuel, Jim called Allied and expressed his displeasure. He was informed that I had canceled the order and offered to get fuel from another source. Jim came up to me and demanded to know why I canceled the order. I explained that Allied was overcharging and I was looking for the best price, which resulted in a heated exchange between us. I heard from one bird that you and he had a physical argument. It happened last Thursday. Maybe I was overconfident when I said I could handle him, but I heard him anyway. Anyway, good luck with your plans. After finishing the conversation, I headed to my makeshift office, turned on my computer and started working on my resume. I planned to start looking for a job the next day. While I was typing on the keyboard, the doorbell suddenly rang. I opened the door and saw Jim standing on the other side. We need to talk, Rob, Jim replied. No, you don't need to, I snapped. It's not my fault, Rob, she seduced me, Jim explained. I was in a bad mood because of what Annabelle had done to me. I wasn't thinking straight, Rob. I'm sorry, but it's not my fault. I never pursued her. You knew she was my wife. You understood the emotions that could arise as you once did when you found out the truth about Annabelle, but you didn't think about how your actions would affect me. Didn't you realize that eventually I'd find out the truth, just like you did with Annabelle? Someone else informed you. And now someone has informed me. In my eyes, you're just a jerk. You should have been my friend. And even if I believed Laura was paying attention to you, which I don't, you should have been as honest as I was when Annabelle was paying attention to me. Even if it's true that she made a move and caught you off guard, it doesn't justify subsequent betrayals. You stabbed me in the back, plain and simple. Why did you deceive me? If I had done what I wanted to do when I found out about this, 
Things might have turned out very differently, but you are not worth risking my freedom. In addition, if Mellows gets involved in the situation, it will lead to prolonged grief that will surpass any physical confrontation. Surprisingly, the anger that I initially felt has dissipated. And at that moment, I grabbed him by the shirt, dragged him into the house, closed the door and poured out all my rage on him. After knocking him unconscious, I carried him out of the house and put him in the car. Despite the possible visit of the police, I felt a sense of satisfaction when I returned to the house. I just needed to say that he attacked me, and I acted in self-defense. And to mention his quarrel with Mellows, and that he was offended with me for selling my share of the business to Mellows, and now he's trying to punish me for it. The next day, I submitted 14 job applications and contacted my lawyer to find out how the case was progressing. He informed me that the hearing on the temporary restraining order is scheduled for next Monday, but he has not heard anything from Laura or her lawyer. I thought about contacting Laura, but eventually decided against it. The longer she waited to hire a lawyer, the longer I could put off talking to her. During the week, I received a lot of responses to the resumes I sent. On Wednesday, I flew to Atlanta for an interview, and on Thursday, I went to Baltimore. Both interviews went well, but I also received interest from a San Diego company. Intrigued by the idea of living in a warm climate, I scheduled an interview for next Tuesday. A hearing on the temporary restraining order was held on Monday, and, to the surprise of everyone present, the judge decided not to support it. I was required to allow Laura access to the house. During the hearing, Laura, who had her lawyer with her, came up to me and tried to talk. I quickly pulled away and found my lawyer, after which I returned to her side. I made it clear to her that she should not communicate with me until my lawyer showed up. Despite this, Laura informed me that she would come to the house that evening. No, you can't come. I have an interview today and I won't be back until Wednesday. Don't be shy, come back after six. Her lawyer tried to speak but I interrupted him. She is not allowed to be in this house unattended. Someone from the court will be there, and you can invite your lawyer there. Unfortunately, it won't work. They won't know what she's doing. If she takes something she's not supposed to, I'll have to fight to get it back. She was not at home for two weeks, and she managed to survive. I think another 48 hours won't be too much of an ordeal for her. Her lawyer insisted on waiting for the judge's decision. When the lawyer turned to the court clerk, Laura intervened, telling him to forget about it and that she could wait two more days. Then she said, Wait a second, Rob. We can talk. I don't think so. And left the building. I thought the interview in San Diego had gone smoothly, and I went home, looking forward to hearing some news. At six o'clock, Laura arrived with a representative of the law firm. A woman from the courthouse arrived shortly after, and we spent the next 20 minutes chatting over a cup of coffee. She explained that her role is to conduct surveillance for the court, make an inventory of seized items, and a list of disputed items. I assured her that it was not necessary. She can have anything she wants. But if you really think that, why are you so opposed to her? She betrayed me. Betrayed me with a man who has been my closest friend for more than 25 years. I couldn't physically harm her without facing legal consequences. But I needed to find a way to get back at her and make her feel the pain she caused me. It wasn't much, but it was something. Suddenly the doorbell rang. After letting Laura and the man who accompanied her from the law office into the house, I went outside to mow the lawn. When I finished work and returned to the house, I noticed that everyone had left except Laura, who was sitting at the kitchen table drinking tea. Looking up at me, she accused me of lying that I had donated her things to Goodwill. I might not have carried out this plan, but I got satisfaction when you expressed your displeasure that I took such actions without your consent. I was surprised to find that everything in the house belongs to her, and it will take me longer to figure it out than I expected. I took the key ring out of my pocket, pulled out the house key and handed it to her. There is no need to move. You can pick up the house on Friday. I'll have all my stuff out by then. She asked. Why? 
Why did you do all this if you were just going to give me the house and leave? I explained that I was interviewing for an out-of-state job and would leave as soon as I found one. Why did I get a restraining order and you lied about giving my stuff away? This may seem like a stupid question, but after the way you treated me, I felt I had to take some action. You should be grateful to me that I decided to solve the problem peacefully and not resort to cruelty. What I did doesn't make up for what you did to me. It was the only way to get revenge without breaking the law. I know you declined my request to talk tonight, but I'm still going to try to convince you that our marriage shouldn't be ruined. Let's be honest, Laura. There's no way we can continue our relationship after what you've done. Rob, my feelings for you haven't changed. I still love you despite the mistake I made with Jim. I've always felt sympathy for Jim, but it's never been love. I don't care if you had feelings for him, what you did was still infidelity. You need to remember how I reacted to Annabelle's actions with Jim to understand my feelings about this situation. I was very upset and planned to meet with him about it, but you convinced me not to do it. It was supposed to let you know how I would feel if you betrayed me. Don't try to justify yourself, they say. I didn't want you to find out. Cheaters are always caught sooner or later, just like Jim found out about Annabelle when someone saw them together and told him. That's how you got caught. Someone saw you and Jim go into the motel room and told me. Is my love for you not important at all? I'm sorry, Laura, but that's not a valid reason. Your love wasn't enough not to cheat on me. It may seem like nothing to you, but it meant everything to me. How can you call being close to my ex-best friend an accident? He came when you were in Santa Fe upset about Annabelle. He missed her, even though he cut her out of his life. We had a drink, and soon he started crying. I hugged him, comforting him, even though I knew it was wrong. It was nice, even though I knew I was wrong. When Jim visited you while you were away, we both understood the reason for his presence. We resumed our physical relationship devoid of any emotional connection. It was just a contact, Rob, a fleeting thrill in everyday existence. Despite everything that has happened, I have never neglected you. Rob, I love you deeply, and you know it. I sincerely believe that we can overcome this and not resort to divorce. Laura, our love has nothing to do with this. I need to end this marriage. I can't go on living with a woman who betrayed my trust. It's a simple fact, Laura. You betrayed me. If I had stayed, I would have always suspected and expected you to hurt me again. You admitted that you like cheating, so I can't stay with you anymore. You can make any promises, but I can't trust them. You already broke your promise to put me first when we got married. I can't believe anything you say, Laura. Jim's version of events is completely different from yours. According to him, it wasn't an accident, but you were playing games with him. I do not know who to trust, but after what happened, none of you are trustworthy in my eyes. Laura, the truth is, we're not a couple anymore. I'm not going to give up, Rob. I intend to fight for our marriage. Our love will help us get through this difficult time. I understand that you're mad at me and you have every right to be. But I promise you that I will keep my word, especially after I realize the consequences of the violation. My lawyer suggested that I get a consultation which I think may be useful. I refuse to let you go, Rob. I love you too much. I want to make it clear that I'm not ready to be with you. It's true that I still have feelings for you, and it's going to take me a while to move on. But I can't imagine that you and I will have a relationship again. Just the thought of being intimate with you brings back painful memories of how you were with my best friend. I cannot accept such betrayal. If you prevent the divorce, I will have no choice but to share the video of your meeting with Jim. All your loved ones will see it, including family, friends and colleagues. I will even go so far as to create a porn site with your participation. There are many amateur sites where I can upload videos with your full name and address. It will definitely bring a revival to your life. You're lying, Rob. This video doesn't exist. Really? Wait. I took a copy of the CD out of the briefcase in the closet, returned to the kitchen and handed it to her. Look at him. After you look at it, decide if you want others to see it. I have some business to settle, so please leave. You can pick up your house on Friday. 
I spent Thursday and Friday packing up my things and putting them in the storage room. Then I rented a room in the executive suite for a month, hoping to find a job by then. Over the next two weeks I attended interviews in Salt Lake City, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Chicago, and Detroit. Despite the fact that all the interviews were positive, unfortunately, I did not receive any follow-up responses. After sitting down at the negotiating table, I analyzed my finances and realized that I could live without a job for about six years. I started exploring different cities and states in search of a lower cost of living that could potentially extend my financial situation to eight or even ten years. Laura signed the divorce papers and sent them back to my lawyer. I was a little sorry that she did it. I would have loved to scatter her and Jim's CDs all over the house, but a deal is a deal. I made an agreement. The agreement provided for a 50-50 division of property, with each party having to pay the legal costs themselves. As the sole plaintiff, I have paid the legal fees. Laura expressed interest in keeping the house for herself, and my half of the capital exceeded the amount owed to the bank, so I agreed. Although I had to share half of the proceeds from the sale of my stake in the company with Laura, I foresaw this and agreed. Despite the fact that Laura criticized the sale price, it did not bother me, since most of the proceeds from the sale were safely stored. I recently heard an intriguing gossip. Allegedly, as soon as I disappeared from sight, Jim began harassing Laura to such an extent that she had to file a restraining order against him. Personally, I found it funny, but I mentally vowed to wait for an official divorce before taking any steps. Finally, I started getting calls from the companies where I was interviewed. A company from San Diego contacted me and asked for a meeting to discuss my return. No sooner had I scheduled it than Gary Mellows called me. Do you want your company back? He asked. Confused, I asked why I should return it if I had sold it to him to escape Jim. Why would I become his partner again, I thought. After our last fight, I told him, If you are so unhappy with me as a partner, I will buy out your share and sell your half to someone else. After thinking for half a minute, I asked what price he wanted to get for his share. I'll settle for half of what I paid you. But the main question is, why should I return it? If you have carried out at least half of your plans to sabotage Jim, then the value of the company has most likely decreased significantly. You may have a surprise waiting for you. We'll meet at the office to discuss further. Wasting no time, I decided to talk to him. As soon as I entered, Maria enthusiastically got up from the table and hugged me. Sticking her head in the office door, she informed Gary of my arrival. As you already know, I bought out your share to annoy Jim but otherwise I didn't need it. But my priorities have changed. Construction is becoming more and more important to me, and I want to distance myself from the engineering side of things. I was faced with the problem of finding suitable engineers, which made me think about the choice. It occurred to me to contact you and suggest the idea of creating a company with which I could subcontract engineering work. After Jim sold me a share, I started thinking about selling it to you. I just can't afford to buy back my half and Jim's half. The value of the company has decreased significantly so you don't have to pay a large amount for it. I've already transferred all the construction work and equipment to my other company, leaving only the engineering aspect. I'm ready to sell you the company for the same amount that I paid Jim, and we can sign a five-year design contract. In addition, the company still maintains agreements with 15 other enterprises. It seems like a win-win situation. How much money did you offer Jim? He named the amount, and it turned out to be less than what I had in my foreign account. But there is one condition. Which one is it? I was extremely honest with Maria and told her about this offer. She said that if you agree, she will stay with you and will not transfer to my company. If you accept this offer, she will remain your partner. I made a quick decision and informed him that I agreed to the deal, but on the condition that I wait until my divorce was formalized, which was at least three weeks away. Gary agreed, and we completed the deal. As I was leaving the office, Maria reminded me, I heard about your agreement. 
Don't forget that after these three weeks, I have to become a priority. I doubted the seriousness of her intentions, but she assured me with a bright smile that she was really serious. As I was pulling away from the curb, the phone rang and my lawyer was on the line. Jim finally realized the consequences of his actions after Gary decided to sue him, prompting Jim to offer a settlement agreement. Without hesitation, I instructed my lawyer to accept this offer. Arriving at my executive suite room, I couldn't help but smile at the prospect of starting a new chapter in my life. In just three weeks, I will embark on a new journey with a new job, a new partner and some financial security. Instead of worrying about finding a new home and buying furniture, I will be able to focus on the exciting opportunities that open up in front of me. Who says the good guys always finish last? In the end, I did not feel sorry for Laura. I realized that revenge must happen. I posted a video of her and Jim having sex on 10 websites and attached Laura's name and contact details. This will allow her to become more popular. This is my little revenge for a cheating wife. Watching my wife Amy, whom I have been married to for three years, enter into an intimate relationship with a man named Reginald, whom she dated in the past, I was grateful for the wise decisions I made in the past. At that moment, I realized that I also needed to act wisely. Unfortunately, I didn't have a camera, as my phone was under repair, and I just saw that they were having an intimate relationship. To make matters worse, Amy and I were supposed to be at her father's house for dinner in less than an hour. I knew that as soon as I got the camera out, the opportunity to take a picture would disappear. But when Reginald's car blocked Amy's car, I saw a chance to take a little revenge by being careful. Putting on gloves, I quickly loosened the valves on three of his tires, let the air out, and then closed the valves again. I grabbed a rubber hammer from the garage, hid behind a bush and waited for Reginald to hurry out of the house. While he was swearing and kneeling near the right front wheel, I hit him with a rubber mallet, knocking him unconscious. I tried not to hit him too hard, just enough to knock him unconscious. I quickly pulled the car keys out of Reginald's pocket and threw them into the depths of the nearby forest, using my skills as a former football player so that they would never be found. Then I pulled out his credit cards, driver's license, and a measly $28 in cash from his wallet, surprised that a rich man like him had so little money. And finally, I erased all traces from the crime scene. After washing the blood off the hammer with a cloth soaked in bleach, I returned it to the garage and put the cloth in a plastic bag along with my credit cards and license. Clutching a plastic bag in my hands, I hurried to my car, which I parked a few hundred yards from the house so that Reginald would not find me, and quickly drove towards my father-in-law's house. On the way, I passed a 7-Eleven store with one of the few remaining payphones in America. I parked at the nearest store. I took off my jacket, replacing it with a baseball cap, hoodie and mirrored sunglasses, and headed for the phone. After giving a teenage girl $28 at the store, I asked her to anonymously call emergency services and report a man lying in the driveway of 15 Ridgeway Terrace. After throwing a plastic bag with a rag, credit cards and a driver's license into a dumpster at the 7-Eleven store, I drove to my dear father-in-law, arriving 10 minutes earlier than the scheduled time. As you can see, I didn't like him very much. He liked me, though only because I was the best producer at his prestigious insurance company. In other words, he appreciated the profit I was making. My father-in-law, the rich and arrogant Chester Grimes, always thought Amy was too good to marry a middle-class man like me named Blake Bristol. In fact, based on moral principles rather than wealth, I was too good for both Amy and Chester. Chester really appreciated punctuality, so I decided to call Amy on his landline and ask why she didn't show up at the appointed time. Amy looked worried and upset when she picked up the phone. Hi Amy, where are you? Your father is starting to get a little annoyed, I said. Amy replied, Well then, I'm sorry I'm late. A crime has occurred in front of our house and the police are already here. Then she turned to the officer. Yes, this is my husband Blake, but I don't think you have anything to talk about with him. 
I heard Amy cover her phone with her hand during some argument in the background. Then there was the sound of handing the handset to someone else. This is Detective Burns. Is that Blake Bristol? The voice on the other end asked. Yes, it's me, officer. What happened? Is my wife okay? I asked anxiously. She's physically fine, Mr. Bristol, but a man named Reginald Swifton was attacked in your driveway and taken away in an ambulance. His car is being evacuated now, Detective Burns explained. Shocked, I asked. What was Reginald Swifton doing in my house? I screamed in anger, trying to make Chester Grimes hear me. Your wife did not give us a clear explanation? Do you know anything about this? What the hell? He's her ex-boyfriend. Maybe he just stopped by for a while. How should I know? I hope he got what he deserved. No need for harsh language, Mr. Bristol. So you don't know why he was at your house and who attacked him? No, but if you find this guy, tell him I'd like to buy him a beer. I asked Burns, could you take my wife to the hospital to get a swab and prove that Swifton's DNA is present? Burns replied, I can't do this if she doesn't agree. I'm worried that she might have been abused and is too afraid to talk about it. Could you force her to go under such circumstances? Burns explained, if she doesn't report the attack, I won't be able to force her. So, take detailed photos to check for signs of an attack, such as bruises or bleeding. Burns agreed to do it, and I thanked him for his help. Detective Burns, could you get Amy, the potential victim of the crime, on the phone again? I asked. Yes, although I'd rather talk to you tomorrow. Give me your number so we can get in touch. Call me to make an appointment, and I will come to you, I informed him and then dictated my mobile phone number. Hi Blake darling, Amy started to say, but then stopped. Stop talking nonsense Amy, I want you to go to the hospital immediately. Detective Burns will take a vaginal swab test from you to determine if Reginald attacked you. No, where did you get the idea Blake? You have to prove to me that you didn't have intimacy with him. How can you accuse me of cheating at a time like this? Amy started crying. At a time like this, I replied, this jerk was attacked, I don't care about him and you shouldn't care either, I shouted, pausing for effect. Listen honey, either you take a swab in front of the police before you take a shower or I'm filing for divorce. Go to hell, she shouted before I ended the conversation. Chester's face turned pale with anger. What the hell was that? Well Chet, I replied, knowing that he hates being called Chet. Your daughter cheated on me with Reginald Swifton, so I'm filing for divorce. Digesting the news, Chester hissed. You can't talk like that to me or about my daughter. I have to fire you. At that moment, the phone rang. I knew it was Amy calling, so I picked up the phone and put it down right away. Can you write this down for me? I asked impatiently, grabbing a pen and notebook from the kitchen counter and handing it to him. Despite the pain of not making money for people like you anymore, I can accept being fired. Chester continued to stutter, muttering about my lack of manners and ingratitude as he wrote. Thanks, idiot, I muttered, leaving the room and holding my pink slip in my hands as the phone continued to ring in the background. I understand that my behavior may seem strange and incomprehensible, but hopefully, given the context, everything will become clear. The two important documents I mentioned earlier are the prenuptial agreement between Amy and me and the employment contract with Chester's company signed at the same time. I convinced Amy and Chester to agree to a new provision in their contracts. I suggested making the prenuptial agreement reciprocal, that is, if one of them causes physical damage to the other or enters into an extramarital affair, the sanctions provided for in the prenuptial agreement will take effect. This meant that in my case, I would receive $500,000 from Amy's trust fund, and the rest of the property would be divided equally. In her case, she would have received 85% of the assets. Fortunately, we did not have children, but if they had appeared, the party found to be unfaithful would have lost custody. I never raised my hand against Amy in anger, and despite the many chances, I did not cheat on her. According to my employment contract, if I am fired or my earnings or responsibilities decrease by 10% or more, 
then the conditions of non-competition will cease to apply. Although I had no concrete evidence, I was unable to divorce Amy due to infidelity and receive what was owed to me under our prenuptial agreement. During the year I had suspicions about her, and I collected a significant amount of circumstantial evidence. Even before the incident with Reginald, I had gathered circumstantial evidence of her infidelity. My friend and lawyer Ron Botts, who also comes from the middle class, assured me that the evidence I have can be used in court, and it will work in my favor if the judge is chosen correctly. He also advised me on how to handle the divorce and what steps to take during the upcoming trial. He advised me not to close accounts, not to transfer money or securities, not to cancel credit cards and so on, until we receive a court order to register and freeze assets. Hasty actions may displease the judge and harm our case. After leaving Chester upset, I bought a disposable mobile phone and contacted Ron's office. Why are you still working at 7 o'clock on a Friday night? I asked. Ron jokingly replied, I provide services to helpless people like you. Then I explained the situation to him, starting from the moment I arrived at Chester's house. Ron gave me clear instructions. Instead of heading home that evening, he advised me to check into a hotel, save the checks and make sure I was in the field of view of the surveillance cameras. The next morning, a private detective with a video camera had to accompany me home to leave a recording. Meanwhile, Ron will sort out the situation with Reginald and begin divorce proceedings on Monday. I followed his instructions, and the next morning, Saturday, the private investigator and I entered my house, the place where the incident with Reginald took place. The private investigator came in through the side door, and I went in through the front door. I made a fuss and shouted, Amy, I'm just here to get my stuff and leave. Amy hurried down the stairs, furious. Who do you think you are accusing me of cheating and forcing your father to fire you? You're just a bastard. I asked. Did you remember to take an intimate swab? No way. She shouted before I interrupted her. Well, then we have nothing more to discuss. I'll just take my clothes and leave. Amy was so focused on scolding me that she didn't notice the private investigator but he managed to take clear photos and videos of her flawless face and skin without cuts and bruises. I locked the bedroom door, ignoring her frantic banging and screaming, and quickly packed my things into two suitcases. I looked at the sheets, but she had already changed them, probably getting rid of the old ones. Without saying a word, I grabbed my suitcases and walked past her, heading for the exit. When I left, a private investigator filmed her screams and protests with a telephoto lens from the car. While Amy and I were upstairs, he discreetly installed a long-life voice recorder in the kitchen. As we were leaving, I asked about the quality of the photos and videos. Perfect, he replied, noting that there were no visible marks on them. The decision to use a voice recorder turned out to be brilliant. That evening... We overheard a conversation between her and her friend Lila Castle. Amy convinced Layla to physically hurt her, resulting in bruises on her face and arms, as well as small cuts on her arms and neck. Having fulfilled Amy's request, Layla went with her to the clinic to fix cuts and bruises and take photos. Meanwhile, the private investigator and I returned to my house to pack up the remaining things and pick up the recorder, as Ron predicted. On Monday, we filed a lawsuit for adultery, and by the end of the week, Amy filed a counterclaim for physical assault. On Monday, when Amy was handed the divorce papers, I visited Detective Burns. Where were you during the Reginald Swifton incident, Mr. Bristol? Burns asked after the first pleasantries. I replied with my arms crossed. It looks like you suspect me. Burns replied, We have evidence linking you to the scene of the incident. I replied, then you have to arrest me because I won't talk to you anymore and I need a lawyer. I knew he had no proof. Burns warned, do you really want to do this? You will look guilty. When I asked for a lawyer, you had no right to ask me any more questions, but that's exactly what you did. Either arrest me or I'm leaving, I said, getting up and heading for the door. We'll be in touch, Burns said calmly, showing no signs of confrontation. Only with my lawyer, I replied,
handing him one of Ron's business cards before leaving the room. I didn't get any more messages from Burns, and neither did Ron. Looking back, I wish I had known about Ron's conversation with another private investigator, Dan Drake, during the filing of the lawsuit and counterclaim. Dan Drake was also a friend of Ron's. My concern would have been much less, and I would have better understood Ron's unwavering confidence in our business. The conversation between Ron and Dan took place two days after the counterclaim was filed. Ron only told me about him after the trial. Dan, I don't want you to reveal the details of what you know, but I have a few questions that need to be answered, Ron said. Go ahead, Ron. I'll help if I can, Dan replied. Dan, do you know the name Amy Bristol? Yes, something familiar, Dan confirmed. Have you worked with clients who were interested in Amy Bristol's activities? Ron asked. Yes, I was working, Ron. Can you tell me their names? I'll get in touch with them and call you back, Ron. A few hours later, Dan called back. Their names are Elizabeth Moore and Jamie Watkins, he said before Ron interrupted him. Don't tell me anything else, Dan. Maybe one of the clients wants you to follow the divorce process with Amy Bristol. All right, Ron. I'm sure at least one of them will be interested. I'll give you the date. Thanks, Ron, he added, and hung up. While this conversation was going on, I was discussing with Chester's main competitor the possibility of employment. To my surprise, I was immediately offered this position with a salary equal to what I earned at Chester, and almost twice the commission. Having no restrictions, I quickly contacted my former clients, and within a week most of them had transferred to my new employer. This success made it easy for me to cover the costs of Ron and the private investigator. From the start of the divorce process to the date of the trial, I consistently outperformed Chester's company in attracting new clients, winning more than 80% of the cases. By filing for divorce, Ron initiated an asset freeze, which was approved. This meant that neither Amy nor I could access our funds except to cover legal costs, payments authorized by the court, or special requests agreed upon by both parties or ordered by the court. No action was taken, such as cashing out CDs, canceling credit cards, transferring money from joint accounts to individual accounts, selling shares, canceling insurance policies, or auditing deposit boxes. Although the judge's decision seemed unfavorable to me, Ron assured me that in the end, it would be beneficial for us. The case was handled by Judge Matt Moore, the youngest and newest judge in the family court. He was energetic, confident, and handsome, but I had suspicions that he was against us. I met Matt Moore only once, at a 4th of July celebration at his neighbor's house, about a month before he was confirmed as a judge. This memory is related to the fact that I had a disagreement with Amy that night because she got drunk and left me alone. During our short conversation, Matt spoke fondly about my father-in-law, Chester Grimes. I asked Ron about our decision to forego a jury trial, expressing concern that Matt's relationship with Chester Grimes might lead to bias against us. Ron just smiled back. Let's not overdo it. I have everything under control. I want to give you more than the prenuptial agreement requires, he said confidently. Then Ron started explaining the pre-trial process to me. He mentioned that at the disclosure stage, we will need to disclose all the evidence that we plan to use. The only exception is if we use something solely for the purpose of impeachment, to question the credibility of a witness or a party. In this case, we did not need to disclose either the evidence or the identity of the witness. Ron didn't mention his conversation with Dan Drake and he didn't have any revealing information from that conversation. Amy's lawyer, Amanda McAfee, did not disclose this information during the investigation. When we received from Amy's lawyer the answers to the interrogations that Amy gave under oath, it was not surprising that Lila Castle was listed as a witness to the alleged assault on Amy. The attack allegedly took place on the Saturday after the incident with Reginald when a private investigator and I entered my house to pack our things. Ron quickly noticed Lila's testimony before we could respond to Amy's requests for disclosure. 
Amy and I attended the videotaped testimony of Lila on Monday, although we did not communicate with each other. Ron took the opportunity to ask Lila about the date of the alleged attack. So, Miss Castle, you're sure you witnessed the attack before you escorted Mrs. Bristol to the clinic for treatment that Saturday, right? Layla, trying to look confident, replied, Yes, I'm sure. Then Ron asked, You didn't hurt Mrs. Bristol yourself, did you? Layla and Amy were stunned, and Amanda McAfee looked confused. No way, Lila doubted. I will show you an audio recording that, according to an unbiased witness, was made that Saturday after Mr. Bristol left his house. Let me know if you recognize the voices. When Ron pressed the play button, the faces around the table turned pale. When the recording ended, Ron asked, Do you recognize the voices? Weren't you and Mrs. Bristol discussing how to frame Mr. Bristol so that he would attack you? Layla burst into tears and said, you must have set everything up. Ron assured her, A voice expert will compare your voice on the tape with your testimony and send the case to the district attorney for perjury charges. I have no more questions. Amy's lawyer did not cross-examine her. Two days after Layla's testimony, Amanda McAfee asked for the counterclaim to be withdrawn and demanded reconciliation from the court. She suggested suspending the case for two months so that the parties could find a certified mediator for reconciliation. Ron strongly objected to this motion, stating during the oral proceedings, Their counterclaim was filed in bad faith, and we would like to be able to address this issue during the trial, as this will affect the credibility of Mrs. Bristol, and my client is not interested in reconciliation. Due to the fact that the case has been suspended, he loses interest on $500,000, which he wants to recover from Mrs. Bristol. Judge Moore, demonstrating bias, granted Amy's motion, but offered a small concession. If the reconciliation does not take place and Mr. Bristol wins the court, Mrs. Bristol will be required to pay two months' interest at a rate of 4% per year on all funds owed to Mr. Bristol, in addition to the division of the inheritance. Ron reminded me to carefully follow the instructions in the correct order during the reconciliation procedure in order to avoid sanctions from the court. He advised me not to use swear words, no matter how great the temptation. Curious, I asked if the word slutty woman was considered a swear word. Ron grinned and replied that he didn't, but advised me not to use that word and instead call her a grossly unfaithful spouse. Unsurprisingly, just two days before the scheduled mediation session, I received a letter from Chester Grimes. I avoided his calls and texts. The letter contained an apology and an offer to reinstate me in my previous position with a significant increase in salary and commission. I saved it for possible proof, but decided not to answer. Lawyers were not allowed to mediate, only interested persons. Amy looked amazing immaculate outfit, makeup, and hairstyle. Despite my dislike of her, I couldn't help but notice her attractiveness and imagine another scenario with her. Due to the lack of a dress code in the order, I came in cut-off jeans, sandals, and a worn college t-shirt that Amy despised. She had already tried to throw it away twice. Besides, I hadn't shaved in two days, and my hair was unwashed and unkempt. Amy immediately realized that our relationship was doomed, but she continued to insist, probably guided only by considerations of $500,000. Mr. Bristol, your appearance is very unexpected, the mediator remarked. The order didn't specify a dress code, so I decided to show up like this, I replied. I'm sorry if this doesn't meet your standards, I replied, trying to keep my tone neutral, although I most likely failed. The mediator continued to explain the process while Amy and I were silent. Even though we were the contenders, she let Amy speak first. Shouldn't I be the first to act as a plaintiff? I asked. As an intermediary, I have the right to determine the order, she replied, clearly still annoyed by my presence. Amy seemed like a great actress. She expressed her love for me and asked why I doubted her. She recalled the wonderful moments of our life together and shed tears at the right moments to add drama. It took a good 30 minutes. Either the mediator was moved by Amy's words, or he was trying to move the discussion forward. But as soon as Amy finished speaking, 
she turned to me with tears in her eyes. Mr. Bristol, what can you say to your beloved wife who has just poured out her heart? I replied, she is not a beloved wife. She's a constant liar who betrayed my trust. She is a liar, as evidenced by her story that I beat her up. Her entire performance was a charade to save $500,000. I do not know if she ever really cared about me, but it does not matter to me. I don't love her, moreover, I hate her, and I want to get divorced as soon as possible in order to move on. The mediator and Amy were stunned. During the rest of the session, I sharply answered questions and statements from both the mediator and Amy. The only answer of more than four words I gave for the rest of the session was when a tearful Amy said, You didn't even give me a chance to explain why Reginald was there before he flew into a rage. Then I explicitly told you to take a swab to prove that you did not have intimacy with him or to accuse him of committing an intimate assault and that if you did not do this, then I would divorce you. It was your choice, put up with it. As a last, desperate gesture, the mediator said, Mr. Bristol, I want you to stand up. Go up to Amy and hug her. Maybe it will revive some feelings in you. I answered immediately. There was no reservation in the order that I should hug her. The thought of touching my ex-wife who cheated on me disgusts me. Politely refusing so as not to lose my composure, I watched as Amy abruptly stood up and cursed loudly at me. She seemed to be on the verge of physical aggression until an intermediary intervened to defuse the situation. Despite the mediator's attempts to calm Amy down, my smirk probably didn't help create a tense atmosphere. The mediator informed me that I could leave. After the mediator informed the court that reconciliation was impossible, the court lifted the temporary ban and allowed the process to continue. Amy's lawyer took a statement from me, during which I answered all the questions truthfully, with the exception of two. These questions related to whether I had witnessed an intimate relationship between Mrs. Bristol and another man before filing for divorce, and whether Reginald Swifton was in my house when we were still married. Although I try to be honest, I decided to hide the truth in these matters. After several months of pre-trial procedures, during which Judge Moore demonstrated his bias at every opportunity, while maintaining fairness with regard to possible appeals, the court was appointed for two months after the end of the disclosure phase. Ron decided not to question Amy for strategic reasons, but he had Amy's answers to questions in which she categorically denied having had sexual relations with another man while married and before filing for divorce. At the trial, we presented indirect evidence of infidelity by three o'clock on the first day. Despite Moore's bias, he knew that the satisfaction of the motion for conviction would most likely be overturned on appeal due to our weighty evidence. Now it was the defendant's turn to present his arguments, and Amy herself became the main witness. Amy swore under oath that she had never entered into an extramarital relationship. Although Judge Moore felt uncomfortable at times, he mostly favored Amy and rejected almost all of Ron's objections. When she finished testifying, it was almost five o'clock, and Judge Moore scheduled a cross-examination for the next morning at nine o'clock. As we were gathering up our papers to leave, a man with a wide grin approached Ron. Ron greeted him with his smile. Although I noticed this man in the courtroom during Amy's testimony, I was not sure of his identity. Blake... This is Dan Drake, my friend, Ron introduced. I shook Drake's hand, feeling confused. I have some information for you, Ron, Drake said, smiling broadly. This is about impeaching Amy Bristol's testimony. Let's go to my office and order dinner, Ron chuckled as the three of us left. In Ron's office, Drake showed us a DVD on which a naked Amy brings James Watkins to a state of bliss when he calls her name. Drake mentioned that he had another DVD, but Ron wouldn't let him show it to us. I need you to testify about the release date of the second DVD, if that's what I suspect. At nine the next morning, Ron began questioning Amy in court. He asked her about Reginald's visit on the day I witnessed their rapprochement, and then asked, Do you know a man named James Watkins? Amy hesitantly confirmed, Yes. Do you know his wife, Jamie Watkins? Yes. When did you first meet James Watkins? 
I don't remember exactly. Wasn't it at your father's party 18 months ago when he came with his wife Jamie? Didn't he move to the city just recently and start working for your father a month before? I suppose so. Was it like that or not? Should I ask him or Mrs. Jamie Watkins to testify? Ron snapped, and his friendliness disappeared. After an awkward silence, Amy hesitated and finally said, Yes, I remember now. I first met him at that party about 18 months ago. So you didn't know him before the wedding? No, Amy replied nervously. Mrs. Bristol, have you ever had an intimate relationship with Mr. James Watkins? Amy shook her head and replied, No, no, you keep accusing me of cheating. After which she burst into tears. Your Honor, I would like to present the DVD as proof. I ask you to show it only on the monitors at the council tables, in the dock, and on the witness stand, but not on the main monitor of the courtroom, Ron explained. Bailiff, please make sure that the necessary buttons are pressed to satisfy this request, the judge ordered. After a short pause and a nod from the bailiff, Ron pressed the play button on the DVD player. A scream escaped Amy's lips, and she quickly covered her mouth with her hands from what she saw on the screen. Is this a video of you and Mr. Watkins engaging in intimate activity, Mrs. Bristol? Ron asked after the video had played for about a minute. No, 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 it's not real. Please turn it off. Amy cried, her voice breaking. No more questions, Your Honor. If there are no objections, I would like to call Dan Drake to testify. Ron announced. Amanda McAfee replied, No questions, and frowned when Amy, visibly upset, left the witness stand. I have to express my disagreement with the use of this video since it was not provided to us during the judicial investigation and should not be used for any reason, said Amanda McAfee. Your Honor, I only found out about his existence around 7 o'clock yesterday evening, but that fact doesn't matter. The DVD and the testimony of Mr. Dan Drake, who will confirm its authenticity, are intended solely to challenge Mrs. Bristol's testimony and for no other purpose. Despite the awkwardness, the judge had no choice but to allow it. The protest has been rejected. If he is duly confirmed, I will attach the DVD solely for the purposes of impeachment. Dan Drake looked like a confident and collected witness. After Ron inquired about his credentials, he confirmed the authenticity of the DVD, stating that he recorded the video at the residence of Mr. and Mrs. Watkins with the consent of his client. Mrs. Jamie Watkins. He also clarified that in the video, James Watkins and Amy Bristol made love at a time when she was still married to Blake Bristol and before the divorce process began. The judge looked visibly agitated by this revelation. When Ron asked if Drake had another video of Mrs. Bristol making love to a married man when she was still married to Mr. Bristol, Drake readily confirmed. Yes, he replied. What is the date of this video, Mr. Drake? The 4th of July, 2012, Drake replied, and turned to face Judge Moore. When we entered the office, Judge Moore took off his robe and sat down in thought. After a moment of silence, he began to address the group. Miss McAfee, it appears that your client, Mrs. Bristol, lied under oath, which could be considered perjury. I may have to report this to the authorities and it may affect my opinion on the case. I will suspend the trial for 24 hours to give you the opportunity to negotiate a settlement. Otherwise, there may be consequences. Unless there are compelling reasons to present new evidence, this will be the next step. Amy and Amanda McAfee exchanged glances, both looking worried. I hereby announce that the testimony in this case has officially been completed. In addition, I am ready to consider a motion to close the protocol. By four o'clock that afternoon, Amy had given me a check for $500,000 with interest, covered all Ron's expenses, and signed a document agreeing to the terms of the divorce, according to which I received 60% of our assets instead of the 50% stipulated in the prenuptial agreement. The extra 10% was a personal bonus. In exchange, we made an agreement with prejudice. I agreed not to mention Amy's perjury to the district attorney, and instead we filed for divorce together due to irreconcilable differences 
and the sealing of the protocol. Later that day, Judge Moore readily approved the settlement agreement, granted permission for the divorce, and sealed the protocol. That evening, Ron, several colleagues, Dan Drake, and even Jamie Watkins joined me for dinner to celebrate. As we toasted the successful conclusion of the case, I quietly asked Ron why Judge Moore was so determined to dismiss the case and seal the record. I don't have any concrete evidence of this, Ron replied with a grin. If I had any, I, as an employee of the court, would have to file an application for Moore's recusal and report it to the Ethics Commission. But I'm sure he had a personal interest in this case, Ron added, and his grin became even more sinister. I didn't have to ask a lot of questions. Everything became clear anyway. A few months later I learned that Judge Matt Moore and his wife Elizabeth Moore had divorced due to irreconcilable differences. The details were not disclosed, but I couldn't help but notice that Judge Moore was now seen driving a five-year-old Ford. It was a stark contrast to the first time I met him at a 4th of July party in the year 2012, where he arrived in a brand new Mercedes. On another note, it was a dark day for me. It was a particularly sad Friday when I anxiously waited for my life to begin to take shape in such a way that nothing would depend on it. All I could do at that moment was wait and see if the impending disaster would actually happen. But I refused to wallow in self-pity like a fool. I remembered the advice my old sergeant had given me a long time ago. Action is the best defense. The only way out for me was to fight, if only to preserve my honor, even if everything else collapsed. Fortunately, the day before, I received valuable information that allowed me to prepare for what was to happen. I ended up in my friend's black Peugeot, hidden in a secluded spot in the motel parking lot. I was informed that my wife would arrive after lunch, and the anticipation of her pulling up in a red Toyota Yaris was both nervous and exciting. Of course, she arrived, accompanied by her lover in his luxury BMW, which he parked next to her car. After exchanging a few words with her, he went to the registration service. I decided to leave my car and go to my wife's Toyota. I opened the passenger side door, got in and handed my surprised wife a brown envelope. What are you doing here, Billy? Stop it! She screamed. I'm just delivering the divorce papers to my cheating future ex-wife, I replied calmly. Enjoy your time with your noble real man. You can stay here forever, I don't care. She began to protest, insisting that I was wrong and that there was an explanation for everything. It's not about cheating. I'm asking for a divorce, and I don't care that you're dating the man who just went to get the key to the room in your secret place. You're free to be with him, and I really don't care. It was obvious that my wife, whom I once loved, was hoping for a more romantic evening with her lover as she began to cry loudly. Now her supposed real man was returning with the key to the room, and when he saw Rebecca still crying in her car. Opening the door on her side, he demanded to know who I was and what I had done to her. While he was talking, I got out of the car, holding a small plastic bottle in my hand. I heard her crying, telling me that I was her husband and that I was planning to divorce her because of their affair. My lover threatened to attack me, but I quickly took action. I aimed the bottle at his face, releasing a jet of water and shampoo that blinded him and made him scream with rage. Taking advantage of his temporary blindness, I took out a second weapon, a dart with three sharp tips attached to the head. With a quick movement, I stood behind him and drove the dart into his left buttock, with the barbed tip firmly fixed in place. By the way his eyes glittered and the way the dart pierced his buttock, I realized that my actions had been crowned with success. I left the unhappy lovers behind and my husband to deal with the consequences of his actions. I drove out of the motel parking lot, leaving behind my cheating wife who was crying loudly in the car. She was sitting there like a lost soul and I was swearing like a sailor. No matter what happened that Friday, one thing was clear. There would be no romantic reconciliation between us. My name is Billy Svensson. A 37-year-old Scandinavian man currently tied the knot with 36-year-old Rebecca. 
Our two children are the only thing that connects us now. Nina and Estelle, who are seven years old, are my and Rebecca's children. We have been together for 11 years and 10 of them are married. Despite the fact that we have everything that most couples in our position dream of, we are not as happy as we should be. In my opinion, the main reason for our unhappiness is Rebecca's mother. Despite the fact that she has neither green skin nor tail nor the ability to spit fire, she behaves like a hostile dragon, constantly causing me trouble. It all started the day I met her. I was invited to dinner at Rebecca's house, but instead of a pleasant evening, it was more like a roasting session. The dragon, as I had already thought about her, bombarded me with questions and made it clear that she did not approve of my name, Billy. According to her, names like Billy, Kenny, Ronnie, Molly, Nellie, and Cindy are not suitable for upper-class families. I couldn't resist sarcastically thanking her for her insight. What surprised me even more was that neither Rebecca nor her spineless father stood up for me while she continued her tirade. She criticized my surname Svensson, calling it a typical farmer's surname that has passed down from father to son. Then she had the audacity to compare me to Rebecca's sister's fiancé, a man from a noble family. Fed up with her arrogance, I stood up and bluntly stated that the man's father was rumored to come from some distant branch of this noble family. Is he just an unemployed parasite on the social security system? I asked before anyone could answer. I need some fresh air, I continued, turning to Rebecca. To my surprise, she agreed to join me as we left this place that looked like a dragon's nest. I've known Natalie's boyfriend Alexander since high school and wasn't shocked that he managed to manipulate Rebecca's eccentric mother and make her think he was perfect for Natalie. It didn't concern me, so why should I care? I wasn't invited to Natalie and Alexander's lavish wedding, but I didn't care. The relationship between Rebecca and me was important to me, which blossomed until it unexpectedly led to her pregnancy. When her furious mother called me to express her disapproval and brand me a scumbag in the eyes of decent people, I didn't care. All hopes of a wedding at her expense were quickly dispelled. The Scandinavian church of Los Cristianos in the Spanish Canary Islands was out of the question. Tenerife was a popular place for intimate weddings, so Rebecca and I decided to tie the knot there, with our best friend next to us. We both got good jobs in a city located 200 kilometers from our hometown, which led to minimal communication with Rebecca's mother, who focused all her attention and resources on Natalie and Alexander. Despite this, the following years were kind to us. We built a happy life with our two children. We made a living, bought a beautiful house, and established strong relationships in a new society. Our intimate relationship remained unchanged. Due to the distance, my communication with Rebecca's family was limited. Her parents never came to us, and we visited our families only in our hometowns. In the end, even Alexander got tired of his domineering mother-in-law. He succeeded at work and accepted a promotion that required moving 280 kilometers away. After a tense conversation with Natalie, he gave her an ultimatum, accept the distance or end the marriage. She accompanied him to his new job. Suddenly, my mother-in-law remembered that she had a daughter named Rebecca and started calling often. Over time, these calls inexplicably led to the fact that Rebecca began to treat me more and more distantly. The conversations mostly boiled down to endless complaints about my actions, inaction and responsibilities, as well as exaggerated stories about the successes of Natalie and Alexander. When I told Rebecca that Alexander had moved to escape from a hostile dragon mother-in-law, our relationship did not improve. The situation only worsened when a new guy from a noble family came to work for her. Rebecca quickly began to idolize him, calling him either Superman or a real man. He was married to a nurse who worked in Africa, and although they planned to buy a house after her return, he was currently renting a room in the city from his wife's sister. Rebecca was constantly comparing me to this new man, criticizing everything from my actions to my clothes. It was obvious who she favored in these comparisons. Despite this, we still maintained a physical relationship, although my attempts were often met with disparaging remarks. 
If it weren't for our children and Rebecca's positive qualities, I would have ended the relationship a long time ago. She was a loyal, great mother, knew how to cook in the kitchen, took good care of her appearance, and we were a good team in putting the house in order and taking care of the garden. If only she hadn't started constantly picking on me and making negative remarks, she would still be the perfect wife in my eyes. I admit that I made a mistake by not being able to stand up for myself and express my thoughts, which only added fuel to the fire of our problems. One evening, after our children had fallen asleep, Rebecca turned to me and said, I would like you to be like my colleague. If you love this lying jerk, why don't you file for divorce and be free to become his slutty woman? But as long as we're married, I'll never tolerate infidelity. If you dare betray me behind my back, rest assured, I will make you pay dearly for your actions. Then Rebecca started shouting angrily, calling me names and demanding an explanation about my alleged betrayal. She was outraged when I called her a whore and made it clear that I would pay for my words. I pointed out the irony in her accusations, reminding her that her clients were actually paying. While we were arguing, two frightened children came up to us, and I quickly turned my attention to calming them down. Two icy weeks passed after our confrontation before any semblance of normalcy returned. During visits to relatives and friends, Rebecca behaved politely, but as soon as they left, her facade crumbled. When we said goodbye to them, she warned, don't count on my services. The following Thursday, chaos ensued when Rebecca's colleague called me at work and quickly got down to business. She explained that a new charismatic man had joined their team, and three women, including my wife, were claiming his attention. Despite our pleas not to interfere, she insisted on pursuing him despite being happily married to me. Now she proudly brags that she won the competition and plans to go to the motel with him tomorrow afternoon. I expressed my gratitude to her and asked her to keep our phone conversation a secret so that I could solve our problem. When I got home from work, I noticed that Rebecca was acting more cheerful than usual. The phone call brought back memories of an old sergeant from my army who admired the tactics of Apache warriors in Arizona, surprise, attack, and then disappear. Having no experience of street fighting, I knew that my only chance of success was to imitate these ancient warriors. Rebecca had mentioned that her companion had a black belt in Japanese martial arts, so catching him off guard was extremely important. Pepper spray is not sold in this country, so I improvised with a mixture of shampoo and water in a small plastic bottle. After a painful ordeal before my own eyes, I realized that this homemade weapon would serve its purpose. The sergeant told us stories about silent arrows that were used in ambushes during the border wars in Arizona, their barbed tips instilled fear in enemy soldiers. Although I couldn't use a bow and arrow against Rebecca's lover, this idea gave birth to a plan in my head. I went to my basement workshop and made a homemade weapon out of a dart, soldering sewing needles to it to create a barbed tip. I was hoping that the barbed tip would be difficult to remove without medical intervention, I wasn't going to try it on myself. Having come up with a simple plan, I decided that by handing Rebecca the divorce papers and momentarily blinding her lover, I would get the opportunity to strike. A well-aimed dart into his buttock will undoubtedly put an end to any romantic endeavors of my wife. I strongly doubted that with a dart in his buttock, he would be set up for anything other than seeking medical help. The next morning, I put my plan into action. Rebecca was wearing a provocative dress, but I chose not to pay attention to it and refrain from commenting. We both continued to go about our usual business on a typical Friday morning. At work, I swapped cars with my friend Eric, swapping our cars, as we often did when he needed a larger car. I spent the morning at the courthouse getting the divorce forms and filled them out in my office. After a thorough search, I managed to contact the main office of the humanitarian organization in Tanzania and get the email address of Rebecca's lover's wife. During my lunch break, I went into Rebecca's office and noticed that both her car and her lover's car were still parked in the parking lot, indicating that they had gone to a nearby restaurant for lunch before heading to the motel. I bought some hot dogs and waited for them at the motel. As expected, the lovers arrived 
and my plan was successfully implemented. My army experience turned out to be valuable, and I was grateful to the old sergeant for his guidance. At 3.30 p.m., the home phone rang, and a female voice familiar from yesterday's call asked if I had visited the motel as planned. Despite the hostility of my wife's colleagues, I tried to cheer her up by filing for divorce, which only led to further conflict. The man from the motel even threatened me with physical violence. I found myself in a situation where I had to defend myself and as a result, he suffered several injuries to his buttock. I suppose my wife should have taken him to the hospital. It wasn't exactly a romantic evening, at least from my point of view. I told her about it. Is that really how it was? What is it? She asked. Yes, it is. I have no reason to deceive you, I replied. My wife is not at home right now, but you can call her on her mobile and ask. Although I can't guarantee that she will tell you the whole truth, I added. She thanked me and asked for Rebecca's mobile phone number, which I provided. I hope they had a pleasant conversation. After that, I sent an email to the man's wife in Africa explaining the whole situation. By four o'clock, Rebecca had already returned home, visibly unhappy. She looked at me and said, We need to talk right now. It was clear that she was unhappy. It's not a problem for me, I replied. You and your lover got what you wanted. You must be completely crazy if you expected me to be a fool and endure this humiliation. I will never accept the idea of being your so-called real man, Rebecca. I refuse to tolerate such disrespect without defending my dignity, I said, although he did not cause her any harm. The injury was so serious that I had to rush him to the emergency room at the hospital. Rest assured, you will answer for your actions. In fact, all four adults and two children in our group will share responsibility for the bill caused by your actions and those of your accomplice. It is absurd to think that a nurse in Africa would be pleased to receive my letter detailing your behavior. Realizing this became a difficult ordeal for her when she found out the truth about her husband's infidelity. The man she thought she knew turned out to be an unscrupulous, traitorous scoundrel. Anger and pain overwhelmed her as she rushed to me with her fists demanding to explain how he could betray her in such a cruel way. I didn't threaten you with anything, I replied coldly, persuading her to just sign the divorce papers so that they could part without problems and in fairness. I warned her that going to a lawyer would only lead to more suffering and expense, and the result would be the same. When my words reached her, she realized the gravity of the situation. Tears flowed down her face as she realized the reality of betrayal and the painfulness of the path ahead. Oh my God, are you really serious right now? Please just listen to me. I swear I didn't do anything wrong. But by blindly following your mother's revenge against me just because I don't belong to the upper class, you let her turn you into a grumpy and vicious person towards me. It's obvious that you admire a colleague who you think is superior to me in every way as you keep telling me. And now I found out that you were competing with two single colleagues for the opportunity to go on a date with this supposedly real man. After winning this ridiculous game, you decided to leave work early today to pick up your prize at the motel. Unfortunately, it also meant that you betrayed me by having an affair with a married man. You know how acutely I feel about infidelity, so your actions are bound to have consequences. Unable to hold back the tears, she continued, I have never cheated on you, not today, not ever. You're the only man I love. Don't forget that we have two children. What about them? Our children are the only reason I didn't kick you out for your constant nagging. I was constantly criticized by both your mother and you, pointing out all my flaws and making me feel inferior compared to the other man you were dating. Because of your infidelity, I felt humiliated and tired of enduring your constant insults. In the end, we both came to the realization that our relationship could not be restored and began discussing the terms of our divorce, agreeing to continue living in the house and remain faithful during the divorce process, Rebecca signed the papers. But just six weeks after she prevented an attempted betrayal, my marriage took an unexpected turn. 
Rebecca has turned into a kind and loving wife, a stark contrast to the woman who once treated me badly. We now treat each other cordially and respectfully as we go through this new chapter in our relationship. We are working more closely together now than in the months when our problems became known. It's true that we no longer share a bed and a bedroom. I can honestly say that I do not miss the hasty intimacy that we had at that time, before her betrayal. It may sound silly, but I prefer to believe her when she insists that she has never slept with her other partner. The date at the motel was supposed to mark the beginning of their relationship, which was interspersed with physical intimacy from time to time. The man's wife insisted that he go to Tanzania and volunteer at an aid camp until her own commitments were over. He agreed in the hope of saving their marriage. After his departure, my wife contacted me by email, assuring me that he was fine and that she had forgiven him. She even begged me to forgive Rebecca, but I do not know what to do, because there is still a lot of time before our divorce process. One can only wonder if Rebecca really aspires to be a good wife and how long she will be able to maintain this facade. I usually worked 30 miles from my hometown and rarely had the opportunity to be home during the day unless the job required it. But that Wednesday morning was a rare exception. Around 10 o'clock, I finished my work and decided to drop by my house, although I did not expect anyone to be there. Lisa and Elmer, my children, were supposed to be at school, and my wife Monica used to spend two hours at the gym every Wednesday morning before starting her job at the fashion store at noon. Therefore, it was a bit of a shock for me to see a silver metallic Volvo at our entrance. Monica didn't talk about any visitors, and it was unusual for her to skip weekly gym classes. The sight of the V70 aroused my curiosity, as it was the most common car in our area and did not give any hints as to who might be its owner. Our car registry is a nationwide database that allows you to get information about the owner of a car using a mobile phone. By sending a text message with the car number to the registry, you can get the name and address of the owner within a few seconds. I was intrigued by the response I received from the registry, as it followed that the car belonged to Paris Fashion AB, the store where Monica worked. The store was run by Alina Alfredson and Eric Alfredson, who were about 40 years old. Eric was infamous for his ability to climb the career ladder and gain influence. I hardly knew any of them, as I had never participated in their social gatherings. Why were they in my house so early in the morning? If Alina was there, then there was a serious reason for it, most likely related to Eric. I started to worry that it might be something negative, given the rumors that are circulating around him. But I did not lose hope that there was a plausible and innocent explanation for their unexpected visit. I prepared for any scenario by making sure that my phone's 5 megapixel camera was ready to work, although I didn't expect that I would need it. Sneaking into the house, I found that the kitchen and living room were empty. My heart started pounding when I heard muffled sounds in the distance. As I approached the closed bedroom door, I heard a woman's voice, most likely Monica's. Wasting no time, I got my cell phone camera ready, opened the door and carefully stepped inside. Monica and Eric turned their heads in surprise when I went to the bed and quickly took a picture with a flash on my phone. Without hesitation, I pounced on Eric, striking him a series of powerful blows to the face, and then knocked him to the floor and delivered a swift kick to the groin. When Monica's screams filled the room, I shouted at her to shut up. Eric didn't try to resist, but I undressed him and threw him out on the street next to his car. When I returned to the house, I grabbed his clothes and threw them at him while shouting angrily. If you don't leave my territory in the next 30 seconds, I will be forced to physically remove you, I warned. He quickly disappeared, probably without even bothering to get dressed. Inside, I told Monica to leave, get dressed, and not come back until the next day. I also informed her that the children would stay with her parents, and I would take them there after school. When Monica was about to leave, she tried to explain that everything was not as it seemed, and that I was her only true love. I raised my voice again, calling her to silence, and after a few moments she obeyed and left the room. After that, my memories are hazy, 
as if I had suffered a severe shock. Despite this, I clearly remember contacting my employer to explain the situation and ensure my return to work on Monday. I also contacted Eric's wife, informing her of the disturbing discovery that her husband was in bed with my wife. I distinctly remember her reaction, filled with expletives reminiscent of a seasoned dock worker. After that, I ordered the largest garbage container to be delivered to my lawn. Then I took all of Monica's clothes and personal belongings to the garage. I also collected a few leftover things that she brought with her when we first moved in together, as well as gifts from her parents and other relatives during our marriage. All these things were laid out on a plastic tarp on the garage floor. And finally, with the help of an electric chainsaw, I destroyed the expensive bed on which Monica betrayed me. After that, I started destroying all the furniture in the house, except for the children's rooms, which I left untouched. I grabbed the container and began throwing everything that was left in the cupboards into it, filling it with broken furniture. It was an expensive container because Monica always preferred to buy high-quality things. But right now, I didn't care about the cost of lost things because losing a marriage seemed like a much bigger loss to me. I contacted a friend who had a summer house near the city that his family rarely used. I explained what had happened and rented a house until I found a more permanent place to live in the city where I worked. During the lunch break, I got access to our shared bank accounts and divided the funds equally. When everything except my clothes and personal belongings had been taken out, I started cleaning the house. In the evening, I started working in my still untouched home office, uploading photos of Monica and Eric to my computer. In the picture, they are captured from different angles, both looking directly into the camera. There was no mistaking who was in the picture. I was aware of T. Eric's political ambitions at the local and district levels, including his desire to become a prominent figure in his political party. Politicians often seek publicity, and by sending a photo of Eric and Monica engaged in intimate activities to local politicians whose contact details I could find, he undoubtedly received a significant amount of publicity. There was a caption attached to the photo with a detailed description of her character, and I even printed out several copies of the picture. Monica called me several times during the day, but every time I answered, I made it clear that we had nothing to discuss at the moment. To my surprise, the police did not arrive, as I had expected, which indicates that Eric did not report our fight. I spent the night in my son's room, and in the morning, when I saw the mess, I had made in anger and shock, I felt regret. It is not surprising that Vikings were feared in the coastal areas of Europe. But I thought it was better to be a fierce warrior than a fool when faced with infidelity. When I was reading the morning paper, the headline caught my eye. A naked man and a car accident. The article described how a naked man collided with a garbage truck and was injured, despite the fact that the airbags saved him from the worst. One thing I knew for sure. No one could accuse me of involvement in this incident. And I also knew that there was even more drama ahead of me. The newspapers were full of scandals, especially those related to a famous politician. When Monica returned home at 10 in the morning, she was shocked to see a container on the lawn in an almost empty house. She screamed for several minutes before finally asking me, What have you done? I replied, What have I done? What did you do? You ruined our marriage and I've dealt with the remnants of it. Your things are in the garage. Please take them away before the house is sold. She was screaming. Do you even care what happened to Eric or that I lost my job? Don't put the blame on me. Is it my fault that Eric and you ruined our marriage and your career? There was no response. Instead, she strode through the house, realizing the seriousness of her infidelity and let out a piercing scream. She then contacted the authorities and waited for the police to arrive on the street. Two young policewomen approached me and asked me to search the house. I gave permission, and they asked about Monica's things, after which they spent some time in the house and garage. As they prepared to leave, they expressed sympathy for Monica, although they admitted that my reaction was excessive. Monica angrily swore at me and ran out of the house, 
taking our children to her parents. The next day, I contacted her parents to arrange a meeting at the cafe to discuss it, as Monica refused to talk to me. We couldn't change the past, so we decided to focus on the future. I have always had a good relationship with Monica's parents, so I honestly told them about my plans to move closer to work. I wanted the children to stay at their current school and be close to their friends, so I offered Monica full custody. My only request was to see the children every weekend and on special occasions, as well as during joint holidays. Monica's parents agreed that it is important for children to have a strong bond with their father. They even offered to help Monica buy our house from me. Monica was surprised at how well the negotiations went and agreed to meet with me to discuss the details. We met at the same cafe where I talked to her parents, and although we both knew there was no turning back, we focused on finding solutions for the future. We came to an agreement about the kids, and she mentioned that she and her parents were going to buy me out of the house. With the help of his contacts, my boss found me a wonderful apartment with a good location, which I moved into in just a month. One Friday when I was without children, my colleague Anna invited me to dinner with her and her husband Rolf. To my delight, they also invited Rolf's recently divorced sister Eliza. Eliza and I, a younger and amazingly sociable woman, had a great evening together. The next morning we agreed to go to a large shopping center in the capital of the district. The trip was a success, and Eliza's five-year-old daughter Helen and I quickly became friends. Later in the evening, Eliza and I decided to cook dinner at her house together. The three of us had a great time in the kitchen. When we sat down to eat, Helen looked at me and asked bluntly, Do you want to marry my mom? Caught off guard, I hesitated before answering, I wish I could, but your mom needs to think about it first. Are you considering this? Eliza smiled at both of us and replied, Oh yes, I promise to think about it seriously. Later in the evening when Lena was sleeping in her room, Eliza and I shared a moment of intimacy on the couch. She mentioned that Helen really wanted me to marry her because her father was already living with his new girlfriend and she thought I was the right choice. I kissed Eliza and assured her that I would do my best to keep my promise to Helen. To my surprise, Eliza offered to stay the night if I promised to behave like a good guy. Although I didn't quite understand what she meant, I agreed. I decided not to rush things and act only as it would be convenient for her. I kissed her gently, slipped my hand under her skirt and whispered, It feels like we've been together for a long time, and I've been in love with you all this time. She giggled and asked, Are you teasing me? When I put my hand under her skirt, she made no attempt to stop me. I gently stroked her inner thighs and whispered, No, I'm serious. I'm completely serious. She met my gaze and asked, Are you serious or are you just trying to seduce me? I assured her, I swear I take every word seriously. She held my gaze and confessed, I believe you and I care about you too. But isn't it a bit presumptuous to say such things on our first date? I can't believe how fast it happened. But it happened. And the truth is, I fell in love with you. She did not resist while I undressed her, but made it clear that protected sexual intercourse was not discussed. She didn't take birth control and didn't expect me to have contraceptives on our first date. As soon as we both undressed, I took her into the bedroom and gave her an unforgettable experience. When she reached the peak, it was powerful and she was writhing with pleasure. After that, she confessed that her ex had never been able to satisfy her the way I had. Eliza and I hugged and made small talk for a long time before we finally fell asleep. Eliza was worried that I would see her as just a cheap fling and it would all end, so I tried to assure her of my true feelings for her. The next day, I treated Eliza and Helen to dinner at a popular restaurant, and it seemed to me that we had become a real family. When I returned to work on Monday, my colleagues noticed my enthusiasm and asked a lot of questions about the weekend, which clearly indicated that they were unforgettable. Initially, Anna's dinner was supposed to cheer up the oppressed person, but it turned out to be a pleasant surprise for all participants. Eric Alfredson was abandoned by his wife and political associates after the scandal, which forced him to leave the city. 
Meanwhile, Monica took care of their house and got a new job in the office, while simultaneously exploring online dating options. Although I don't know him, my children speak very well of him. I'm pleased to see that Lisa, Elmer, Eliza, and Helen get along well with each other. Eliza and I are planning a wedding, and she even mentioned the possibility of starting a family. Our relationship is strong, and now we are looking for a house in a good area. Most people have ups and downs in their lives, but at the moment everything is going great for Eliza, our children, our past, and me.